We are back, fellas. I hope you are having a fantastic day today. Welcome back into the channel. And today, as yesterday, we did the must draft wide receivers, the first edition, at least of that. Go ahead, check it out after this video if you have not yet already. Today, we're going to be doing the ones that you do not want to draft, the do not draft wide receivers for the 2020 fantasy football season. And this, once again, as always, is based on average draft position. Oh, Sal, how are you? How are you going to have Cortland Sutton up on the screen behind you? What are you talking about? You're not going to draft him in the 10th? No, 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 no. If he slips three rounds, you're obviously drafting him for whatever reason. These are these are the no-brainer questions to ask. The questions to ask though are where he's currently going and is that value or is that not value? And based on some of the ADP charts that I have uh, on my other screen over here, he is currently overvalued and him on, along with a few other wide receivers that we'll go through, I believe are overvalued. I will explain why they are overvalued and I think there are just some better options in that range right now. Hence the must draft wide receivers, hence the value wide receivers that are going to be coming out in a later video this week. So thank you for being here. Take your shoes off, relax. One big thing that I'm going to tell you about. I have free rookie rankings. Top 50 rookie rankings are down below in the description. I'm working on a ton of stuff for the draft guide. Um, there's going to be like 30 sortable sheets. It's going to be fantastic. I have right now projections already up there. There's a lot of stuff to come out. It's going to be coming out over the next a few weeks. So be sure to check out all that stuff. But the rookie rankings, they're totally free. You can get them right now down below. Take a second, just download them. They're down there. Top 50 rookie rankings by all positions. So you can kind of get an idea of where these guys are going to stand amongst each other. When you get into those later rounds of your drafts, you start taking those wide receivers in your 10th, 11th, 12th round in the, for the rookies uh, running backs, you might start pecking off after the top ones go in those same exact rounds which order do you want to be taking them in who has the best opportunity those rankings should help you at least have an idea it should not be the whole picture but have an idea so get those down below right now like i said take the shoes off get a beverage that you are about to enjoy these next 20 to 30 minutes however long this video is is dedicated right now to you and if you would be so generous into hitting the subscribe button again there's a lot of work that goes into these all i ask for in return subscribe button. totally free to do that and if you hit the notification bell it helps me out a ton all those things help boost the YouTube algorithm, which allows me to reach more people, which allows me to continue to do this as a career and put a lot of time into it, which then gets you more free videos. So appreciate that. It's a, it's a whole life cycle, if you will. Thank you. Hitting the subscribe button, notification bell, like button, all of those things. Download the free rookie rankings. You know what? Let's get into the video. Question of the day for you as it pops up on the screen right now. Calvin Ridley or Debo Samuel in your PPR redraft formats. Let me know right now in the description down below. These are two guys that are getting very much hyped up. I'm not saying overhyped. Maybe they are. Which one would you rather draft, Debo or Calvin Ridley? Let me know down below right now. So starting it off with Cortland Sutton, and I hear all the, the people screaming, all the, the gasps that just went out. Oh, Cortland Sutton, how dare you? Another An alpha X receiver in this league. Look, I, I love Cortland Sutton, but let me tell you some of the facts and let me tell you some of the things that go into the decision as to why I think he is somebody you do not currently want to be drafting at his ADP. Right? Right now, based on the fantasy football calculator, he's going off the board as the 12th wide receiver. He's currently my wide receiver 23. To come into the season before the draft happened, Sutton was a borderline top 15 receiver. So I would have saw that 12th and I would have been like, all right, he's not a not he's not a must fade or do not draft for me. He's he's an okay spot there. I have him at 15, 16, but no, no, no. I dropped him down to 23. Now in 2019, he played in all 16 games. He played on 95.5% of the snaps. He was just very, very reliable. 72 receptions, over 1,100 yards and six touchdowns. He saw 126 targets, which amounted out to a 20 26% target share, 28% of the team's red zone targets. But here is the big kicker. Drew Locke took over the last five games of the year. So what did he do with Drew Locke in those five games? Albeit a small sample, it was not good. 22 receptions for 280 yards and two touchdowns on 39 targets. The target share was good, 7.8 targets per game, but the A dot was reduced. The yards per reception dropped by three, and he only saw 10.6 fantasy points per game during that time with Drew Locke. As opposed to 11 games without Drew Locke, he was seeing 14.4 fantasy points per game. Almost four fantasy points per game more without Drew Locke. And a big reason why was Drew Locke was just not completing deep passes at all. Drew Locke, and you can tell by Sutton's average depth of target or target distance, depending on what you like to use, was dropping and yards per reception. That just kills your upside. Now, the one thing that was nice was Sutton saw 12 end zone targets, not red zone, in the actual end zone last year. Six of them, 50%, came in those five games. So something to take away there, he was at least eyeing in on Sutton, and it makes sense. Your, your biggest bodied wide receiver, your alpha X that you know about out there to target him in the red zone. So at least Drew Locke was willing to be doing that. And he was willing to target him a ton. It was just the skill set of not being able to complete the deeper targets and even the ones in the red zone. So Sutton overall in the league, it was sort of his step up year. I don't know if it was necessarily a breakout year towards the beginning to middle of the year. He was definitely breaking out, but thanks to Sutton and Drew Locke's connection towards the end of the year, it kind of just fizzled out what would have been a huge, huge year for the guy. I mean, if he would have stayed on the same trajectory, you were looking at a guy who was going to probably have over 1,300 yards or at least push for it. He ended up being eighth in target share in the entire NFL, 15th in targets, 20th in receptions, and 17th in air yards. He was a a top 20 wide receiver by all accounts and a lot of metrics show it, but man, oh man, he could have been even more a top 15 borderline top 10 receiver 
if only Drew Locke was able to sustain that production the final five games of the year. Drew Locke himself threw 31.2 times per game, 204 yards per game, and a seven TDs was a 4.5% rate. Uh, his accuracy, his true completion percentage, there wasn't enough statistics and it wasn't enough of a sample to get that, but I can just assure you and hint to you that it wasn't the greatest. Well, outside of Drew Locke, the Broncos did some things in the draft that gave me some pause on Sutton. After the first down, they took Jerry Judy overall in their first round pick, and it didn't worry me that much. I mean, you had Deshaun Hamilton in the slot, not producing much. So put Jerry Judy in there, let him produce some things. Maybe it opens up more for Sutton. But then they go on and they take Cage Hamler in the second round, who's also pretty much a slot kind of wide receiver. He can go on the outside as well. So can Judy, but they have two guys who play a very similar role. They took Albert O, a very fast tight end. After that, later on in the draft, you start to get a little bit of a concern here. They took a Tyree Cleveland, a wide receiver in the seventh round. Won't matter as much, but yeah, this is a fast team. Ian Hardest uh, put his tweet up right now. Yeah, he. this is a team that has just a bunch of guys running insane 40s with Noah Font still out there. Obviously, Cortland Sutton himself ran a 4 5 4. Uh, so yeah, this is a situation where they have a ton of talent on this team. And I'm not necessarily scared about the Hamler and Jerry Judy being out there and snagging up the target share of Sutton, but it's definitely an improvement of Deshaun Hamilton and Tim Patrick. But it's without question an improvement, just both in speed and skill set. Draft capital itself says that. And now you have a situation where Drew Locke, the final five games last year, was absolute dust. So if you're going to be ranking and taking Cortland Sutton as a top 12 pick, where he's currently going at the wide receiver position, at least, you're really banking on the fact that these wide receivers that are coming in don't cut into his production all that much. And I don't think that they do terribly, but then you're banking on Drew Locke taking huge strides forward and actually starting to complete some deep passes down the field. And maybe you want to take that gamble. I personally will not be taking it with a top 12 wide receiver pick. That is why he's currently my wide receiver 23. He's played in 32 games so far in his career. He's been healthy for all 32 of those through two years. And in the target competition, it's going to be a ton of young guys. I mean, you have two rookie receivers in Jerry Judy and KJ Hamler. Judy last year had over 1100 yards on 77 receptions, 25% of his target share at Bama. You have KJ Hamler out of Penn State. He saw 25 and a half percent target share over there, cut 50 56 of 94 targets. Noah Font, a second year tight end coming into the league now. You also have the, the first year tight end in Albert O. Melvin Gordon will catch some passes in the backfield as well. Fant had a really good rookie year as a tight end. This is crazy how, how, how rookie tight ends, like what their standards are, because he caught 40 balls, 13.9% of the target share for 562 yards and three touchdowns, 67 total targets. Like that's a very solid rookie year for a tight end. That, that's just how that's just how much rookies aren't expected to produce in their first year. Because not only do they have to be blocking, they have to pick up different run blocking schemes, passing schemes, they have to be able to release they have to be able to pass protect they have to be able to actually catch run routes all this stuff that's so much so he had a very nice year he's looking to take a step forward but overall yeah i'm not in a situation where i trust drew lock enough to be taking Cortland sutton as my wide receiver 12 i don't know if i'm crazy on that but yeah he's my wide receiver 23 right now he, he's dropped pretty far down my board and oh my god I, I hear all the gasp i hear all the clicks to exit out of the video how dare you talk about our sweetheart debo samuel you just talked about our sweetheart Cortland sutton how are you telling us not to draft these fantastic young second and third year wide receivers look 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 I love these wide receivers. I really enjoy Debo. I had him as a rookie last year on so many of my, my rosters. I let him sit on the bench for weeks before he actually produced. Sutton is an absolute beast. He's an alpha. He's an X. But it's not just their skill sets that matter. It matters where you're drafting them in fantasy. It matters what assets are attached to them and if those assets in their offense and their team in general are enough to warrant them being drafted this high. And right now, Debo Samuel is being taken as the wide receiver 16. Now, to give you some context, these are names that are being drafted after him. So Debo's being taken before these names. EJ Moore, a number one receiver on his team in X. Calvin. Ridley, you have Stefan Diggs, Odell Beckham, Robert Woods, Juju. These are all names that are being taken after Debo Samuel. I get the Debo hype. I understand it. I get that he's the number one receiver out there, albeit he is the number two behind George Kittle, in my opinion, and it's pretty clear. But you're in a situation where you have alpha X wide receivers going off the board after him in terms of DJ Moore, in terms of probably Stefan Diggs and Odell, Robert Woods and Juju. There's no way I'm taking those guys after Debo Samuel, in my opinion. I'm just sorry. It's not happening. George Kittle, the last time I checked, is still on the 49ers. The 49ers last year threw the 29th most times in the game out of 32 teams. So yeah, I don't know if I'm going to be jumping that high, but in those 15 games, Debo provided, and like many rookies, you're not going to produce right off the bat. So that's where the step forward comes for Debo Samuel. But I think of other rookies, like, I mean, DK Metcalf, I've ranked higher than Debo Samuel right now. He's going 16th overall. I have Debo right around my 30th wide receiver. I have DK pushing a top 25 wide receiver this year. So in 2019, Debo played on 72% of the snaps. He saw an 18.1% target share actually increased to 22.7 in the red zone, 81 targets brought in 57 of them, and they're scoring six touchdowns. He was 20th in yards per route run. And this is where Debo, very similar to Brandon Ayuk, their first round draft pick, Kyle Shanahan has a type. Debo was fifth in yards after contact last year, yards after the catch. Absolutely insane. He was 50th in targets overall, 39th in receptions, 30th in touchdowns. Those numbers are going to be very similar for many rookies because they just don't get to start off the jump. It'll take them maybe a quarter to half the season to really get going. Now, this is the thing that I keep hearing about Debo Samuel. Oh, but he's he's such a good running wide receiver. He led the league right last year, 159 rushing yards. It was like 30 more than Curtis Samuel. He had three rushing touchdowns 
touchdowns on 14 attempts. You're telling me that exactly, I did the math, a quick little calculator, 17.9% of his production came from rushing as a wide receiver. And now all of a sudden, I'm supposed to expect that, I get it, it's Kyle Shanahan's offense, but this is going to be a sticky number. This is supposed to stick going into next year. The man had less than one carry a game. He had 14 rushing attempts. And now you expect me to just automatically assume that he's going to be putting up another 15.9 fantasy points on the ground rushing. Another one fantasy point per game is what that amounts out to. Another 1.2 fantasy points per game in terms of his, his rushing touchdown upside. So I'm supposed to just project in now that two to three fantasy points per game is going to Debo Samuel's rushing category when no other wide receiver is getting more than like a half a point per game on average. I'm just not going to be doing that. I understand that it looks sexy on paper what he did last year, but you also have to understand that this is a wide receiver. I get it, it's a run blocking scheme that he's in. But I'm also not banking on the guy to go for 159 yards. And even if he does duplicate that, he leads the league again. He goes for 140 yards. He regresses a little bit by like uh, five, six percent. I'm expecting him to score three touchdowns on his 14 run- rushing attempts, right? Is that supposed to be something I'm projecting in? When almost a fifth of your production is coming from rushing as a wide receiver, albeit a rookie, I'm just not going to be projecting that as something sticky, even though many people are, are assuming that it's just going to be something that's sticky heading into next year. It's not happening for me. Dan Fran did throw the 29th most times per game. Jimmy G attempted just under 30 attempts per game at 29.8. 248.7 yards per game. He had 27 touchdowns. That was fifth most in the league at a 5.7% touchdown rate. So he, he was efficient last year. I mean, he was the number one deep ball passer in the entire league, albeit he he ends up messing up the one that matters the most in the Super Bowl to Emmanuel Sanders. You have the 49ers in the offseason, pretty much just doing a lot through the draft. They get Trent Williams through the draft in a trade because they lost Joe Staley to retirement. We ended up having them getting Travis Benjamin as like a wide receiver depth piece as well. But mainly Brandon Ayuk in the draft was their big one. They took a couple an offensive tackle, a tight end in the draft as well. Last year's Debo's durability, he missed one game. I think it was week six of the 2019 season with a groin strain. So nothing major to concern you about there. Now his target competition as he is the wide receiver two technically on his team behind George Kittle is George Kittle, Brandon Ayuk, the rookie, Jalen Hurd, who was a rookie last year, but missed the entire season, has some back issues, but should be good to go is what they're saying. And then Kendrick Bourne, a guy who came on the field in some three wide receiver sets was a little bit dangerous in the red zone for them as a slot wide receiver. Kittle played on 82% of the snaps last year. I believe he only played in 14 games, but he still goes over a thousand yards, just a beast. He was set for some major touchdown regression, only five touchdowns last year. He had like three touchdowns called back. It was an insane year for him. One, he dropped heading into the end zone. He was tackling like the one yard line so much. He, he could have easily had a 10 touchdown season and you wouldn't even blink twice at it. He had a 28.2% target share. You have the obvious George Kittle as the wide receiver one on this team. You had Debo looking at an 18% target share as a rookie. It did increase as the year went on, but it never really topped that 22, 23% number while Kittles was steadily around 30%. Brandon Ayuk in college caught 65 balls last year, just under 1,200 yards. And he ended up seeing an overall 26.9% of the target share. He can easily put push Debo Samuel, not as a wide receiver one on this team, but just for a decent amount of the target share, at least more so than what the, the hodgepodge, at least the beginning of the year last year of the Marquise Goodwins, the Dante Pettists were able to do. Obviously, Emmanuel Sanders is now out of town. So that's going to open up about 20% of the target share. I do think Debo will take a good chunk of that, or at least some of it. And then you have some going to Brandon Ayuk. You have some going to the acquired Travis Benjamin, if he's going to get on the field a little bit uh, and some of the other players on this team, if they go two tight end sets as well. So there's surely upside with Debo Samuel. I mean, you're taking a, a great rookie year. Now you're jumping into your second year. You have an offensive coach who's an absolute mastermind. You're getting rid of Matt Breida, a pass catching running back, although always hurt. Marquise Goodwin, who didn't play much last year, but another depth piece gone. Then you have Emmanuel Sanders out of there. So it's just going to open up some more upside for you. It's all about ADP though. I'm not drafting Debo Samuel as a top 16 wide receiver or borderline top 15 wide receiver when he's the second best receiver on his team and a run first offense and a guy who had 20% or so of his production come from rushing last year as a wide receiver when most receivers, wide receivers are going to get like three to 4% of their production coming from that. I understand he's not in the situation as most receivers in that offense, but still regression is in store on three rushing touchdowns on 14 attempts for this guy. So for me, I'll currently pass. I will take every single one of those players as of right now ahead of Debo Samuel in drafts. And those players that are currently being drafted right after Debo or pretty far after him are DJ Moore, Calvin Ridley, Stefan Diggs, Odell, Robert Woods, and Juju. Those guys are all uh, borderline top 20. They're all, I believe, in my top 24 wide receivers right now. And Debo himself is not. So that's a spot that just stands out to me as a sore thumb. I will not be drafting Debo at his current ADP as of this recording. So Tyler Boyd is currently coming off the board on many sites and ADPs as a top 25 wide receiver. I'm nowhere near that. He's my wide receiver 38 as of right now. And let me tell you why. Last year in 16 games, 2019, he played on 92% of the snaps, caught 90 balls last year. That's absolutely fantastic. That was eighth in the league in terms of receptions, over a thousand yards, five touchdowns on 147 targets. That was seventh most targets in the league. Saw 24.9% target share. And then the red zone, it dropped off to 14.7%. So why are all these numbers so bad? Well, he was the number one receiver on his team last year, played a lot out of the slot, but now you have AJ Green coming back and they draft T Higgins. Now the downsides last year was that his quarterback play was absolutely atrocious. You had Andy Dalton just suffering last year from poor protection, really bad offense all the way around him. Ryan Finley came in for a stretch there of like a couple of weeks and he was absolute a dumpster fire 
just one of the worst, if not the worst quarterbacks in the league during that time. And Tyler Boyd was still able to sustain some numbers in terms of putting up production, just continuing to see a ton of targets because people just had to funnel him the ball because the only other outlets were a, a, a younger player in Auden Tate who wasn't getting separation, just more of a bigger body. An injured John Ross ended up putting guys in the field at the wide receiver position that you would never even want to be throwing through. Alec Erickson at one point last year, Alex Erickson started to become a viable target on, on the waiver wire. That's how bad it got in Cincinnati. So they were just funneling targets to Tyler Boyd. But these targets were not high upside targets. His A dot was 93rd in the league at 9.6. He was 83rd in yards per reception at 11.6. These are just are not good numbers. Finished overall 27th in fantasy points per game at the wide receiver position with 13.9. And he finished as a wide receiver 17 in overall fantasy points last year. A couple of reasons why. When you stay healthy for 16 games and you are a guy who's going to see somewhere around 120 to 150 targets, you're just naturally going to finish as a top uh, 20 wide receiver unless you're that bad. If you're starting for 16 games, it means you have a skill set. If you're staying healthy, it means you're naturally going to finish like six to eight to 10 spots higher than other guys because they're going to miss one to four to five to the whole season. So Tyler Boyd had a nice year last year out of the slot, but now he's going to automatically become probably the wide receiver too, which in my opinion is better for Tyler Boyd. I don't think he's a true alpha number one. I think he struggles when teams are scheming against him. So now with AJ Green back, and it's a big if what AJ Green will do, I think it does open up more for Tyler Boyd. So AJ Green's back. That's good for in terms of opening up more in the middle of the field. Joe Burrow probably should be an upgrade to what they had last year in terms of Ryan Finley for a quarter of the season and Andy Dalton, who I don't think is the worst of quarterbacks, but at least the expectations are that Burrow can come in and immediately be better. Last year, this team threw the fifth most times per game and you had Andy Dalton in the games that he actually played in those 11 or 12, throwing 40.6 times per game. He had a 3% touchdown rate, which was just disgusting, 268.7 yards per game. In the offseason, the Bengals didn't do much in free agency. I mean, they signed guys like Jockeys Patrick at halfback. They signed guys like Mike Thomas, not Michael Thomas. Mike Thomas is a wide receiver, former Jag, not much there. They lost Tyler Eifert, who was had not been producing that much for them. Andy Dalton, of course, just got released. They got Joe Burrow, and then they lost some offensive tackles. It was mainly the draft where they drafted Joe Burrow with the first pick in the draft and T. Higgins with the first pick in the second round. And now I'm not one of these guys who thinks T. Higgins is just going to come in and dominate. I mean, even in college at Clemson, he wasn't the greatest of wide receivers. I mean, last year alone, he had a little over 1,100 yards, which was great on 80 targets, but he was just in an offense that elevated everybody. He only saw 15.7% of the target share last year at Clemson. So it's not a situation where I think he's a dominating receiver. And based on Tyler Boyd's contract, he's going to be the number two wide receiver on this team if healthy this year. And he likely will be next year as well. So I do think T Higgins will push him a little bit, but I don't think it's going to be the threat of T Higgins that's scaring me off of Tyler Boyd. I just don't think the guy's a top 25 receiver. And if, if T Higgins is there and there's some depth to actually scare him for his job, then it makes it a little bit more risky. But before the T Higgins draft pick, Tyler Boyd was outside my top 30. With the T Higgins draft pick, I think I bumped him down like one or two spots to, I believe, 38 overall right now. It's hard to get engaged on AJ Green. He hasn't played a full season since 2017. He didn't play at all last year. He played only eight games or nine games in 2018. He was great when he played those games before getting injured. 23.5% of the target share, 77 yards per game. He saw six touchdowns, 8.6 targets per game. He was vintage AJ Green, but that was a year and a half ago. It's going to be almost two years ago by the time the season starts. So, what do you get out of AJ Green's a big question mark. You had John Ross. You still have Auden Tate. They're pretty loaded at wide receiver right now. Like, they have some sneaky good depth. Auden Tate last year for those of you that don't remember or recall he was a monster in the red zone he saw 24.6 percent of this team's red zone share he saw 81 targets overall in the season that was 6.8 per game john ross went healthy in only eight games was averaging seven targets per game i mean this guy as well was, was putting up numbers you're looking at john ross only catching 28 balls in the entire season but 506 yards absolute insane yards per reception out of a deep threat target so they do have some depth i mean john ross a former first round pick i don't think they're just going to kick him to the curb he has had issues with injuries but last year he showed flashes of i would say quote unquote greatness some fluky long touchdowns to start the year but he at least showed flashes of being able to get behind defenses. So what I'm trying to say here is that there's no real true alpha. It is still AJ Green, but he is an aging receiver, but it can just be a ton of guys being used in this offense because they have so many guys right now. We'll see what happens if they make official cuts and get rid of Auden Tate or maybe even John Ross. But for right now, there's about four to five to six, if you count Joe Mixon and their pass catching guys, no real tight ends on this team that are a threat. And Tyler Boyd's being drafted as a top 25 receiver, which usually means that you are the number one weapon on your team, or you're in a really good offense and you're the really good number two on your team, like a Calvin Ridley and a Julio Jones or Michael Gallup and a Amari Cooper from last year. And that's just not the case for Tyler Boyd, in my opinion. Before we get into Mike Williams, hit that big old subscribe button, bottom right hand corner. I appreciate it if you could just take those couple of seconds to do that and the notification bell. It really does help me. Appreciate all the positive feedback we're getting on these these summer NFL videos. I'm very, very excited for the next few months. Once the NFL season gets closer, the hype starts to build, the search volume starts to build. So I'm hoping that these videos uh, can one, prepare you for them. And two, also, if, you, if you're able to subscribe, like all that stuff, notification bell, it'll allow it to reach just a, a ton of people and have that potential exponential growth. That's what we're trying to work for here. So thank you so much 
much if you could hit those buttons. I really, really do appreciate it. Now let's get into this man oh man, Mike Williams. Mike Williams is currently my wide receiver 48. He is right now going off the board at wide receiver 38. So that's a decent amount of spots, 10 different jumps there. He finished last year as the 39th wide receiver in fantasy points. He had a very sneaky season as well. Sneaky season and frustrating season if you were an owner of him or playing him in DFS. He played on 87.5% of the snaps. He only caught 49 balls, but he had over a thousand yards, a thousand and one yards to be exact, but just two touchdowns on 90 targets. The regression for this man, I mean, he had a drop touchdown. He had one overthrown. The regression for this man in the touchdown department should be coming question mark, but he also has probably regression coming in terms of the overall yardage department and definitely yards per reception. So he finished up last year in yards per reception as the number two player in the league at 20.4 yards per reception, number one in average target distance as well. He saw 16.5% target share from one Philip Rivers. So now I'm not going to be the one out here and saying, oh, if you see 90 targets, you're only going to score two touchdowns. No, no, no. I, I think he'll score more touchdowns than two if he repeats and sees another 90 or 90 plus targets, even 80 plus targets. You probably see three, four, five touchdowns out of him at a minimum. But I'm also not going to be the one that sits out here and says on less than 50 receptions, he's going to go over a thousand yards yet again. There's a lot of big plays out of him and that's the name of his game, but he also doesn't have the gunslinger in Philip Rivers anymore. Who's not scared to force those balls in there and also throw a ton of interceptions. Now you have Tyrod Taylor. Now you maybe have at some point this year, Justin Herbert. I don't feel as comfortable with those wide receivers or those quarterbacks in play. So last year he finished 25th in yards, 14th in the air yards, 39th in fantasy points and 18th in fantasy points per touch. So he was just an absolute monster down the field. Hence the, the big yard per reception number, hence the big average target distance number, but it's that's due to regress. And even if the touchdowns are due to come up, I'm not too sure it's actually going to matter enough, especially to take a guy as a, a top 38 wide receiver. I know we're not talking about uh, some high profile guys now. These are just bench pieces, maybe flex options, but he's my wide receiver 48. I'd rather have a ton of guys around him. I'd rather have a ton of rookies around him. In the off season, the Chargers did do a good amount. Obviously they got rid of Philip Rivers. They made Tyra Taylor the quarterback right now. They drafted Justin Herbert in the draft. They also drafted some receivers, Joshua Kelly, running back out of UCLA, Joe Reed, a receiver in the fifth round. I'm very excited to see what he can do. KJ Hill in the seventh round out of Ohio State. They added the Packers tackle, former Packer now, Brian Balaga, huge addition. They traded Russell Okun for Trey Turner with the Carolina Panthers. I believe that's also a huge addition. And then they ended up letting Melvin Gordon go, which I think is absolutely fine for them. So Mike Williams did miss one game last year in week three with back spasms, but outside of that, he's been fine. But his target competition this is another reason for concerns. Like they threw so many times last year. 10th most times per game was what the Chargers were throwing last year. I just don't think that's going to be the case this year. And if it is the case this year, I don't think he's going to see these insane numbers that he's seeing on a per target and a per reception basis with Tyra Taylor and or Justin Herbert under center. Keenan Allen, Austin Eckler, and Hunter Henry are the main threats to your target share. And they are huge, huge threats. Last year alone, Keenan Allen played on 91% of the snaps. He saw 104 receptions on 150 targets, 26% share, and just under 1,200 yards by one yard. Then Austin Eckler comes into town as a running back, sure, so shorter targets, the complete opposite of Mike Williams targets, but he's snatching up on 57% of the ta- snaps, 92 receptions, second most in the team on 104 targets, also second most in the team, just missed the 1,000 yard mark with 993 yards and eight receiving touchdowns for Eckler. He's an absolute beast. He was like a wide receiver at 1.5 last year. It was insane. Hunter Henry missed some games, 80% of the snaps, so 76 targets. That's 18.1% of the target share. So that was fourth on the team. Mike Williams ended up slotting in there as third. And then you had Joe Reed out of college. I'm really excited for Joe Reed. I think he can be a weapon. They don't have a wide receiver three on this team. He was a special teams player there in college. College. He caught 77 balls on 116 targets and he scored seven touchdowns, 22.3% target share. And never in the draft when I see Mike Williams' name, I'm like, oh, that's a great value. So he's going to have to fi- drop really far for me uh, to end up getting there. You have a guy set for regression on a per reception basis and an offense in general that's probably set to regress from the 10th most passing offense to at the very best average, I would assume, like 15th. We'll see. I mean, you have a running back that's an extension of the run. So I guess technically they can still run up a lot of passing plays, but just downfield passing deep passes per game are likely to drop with Tyra Taylor and or Herbert under center. And if they aren't going to drop, they're likely to be less efficient than with Philip Rivers. So for me, Mike Williams is likely a no. He's 10 spots ahead of right now where I'm actually planning and willing on drafting him. So usually he will not get there. That's like a one or two round difference based on all the other positions that are on the board. So I am not going to be drafting Mike Williams as of this recording. Let me finish it up with some honorable mentions. Larry Fitzgerald is an honorable mention for a do not draft. He's currently going off the board at wide receiver 74. If you're a Cardinals fan, if you just like Larry Fitzgerald in general, and you just want to get him on your roster out of respect, I guess go for it. But I don't even have him ranked in my top 100 wide receiver. Why are you going to be drafting Larry Fitzgerald when you can draft any of these rookies that actually have upside? Now I get it. If there's no camp or preseason, the rookies have a lot tougher time. But now you have uh, Larry Fitzgerald being at best, at best the third option in this offense, and arguably, in my opinion, the fourth option behind Kenyon Drake in the passing game. I don't want Larry Fitzgerald's three to four targets a game. I don't want his stat line of having uh, 500 yards this year and like four to five touchdowns. Uh, It's just not something that I want to have, especially with DeAndre Hopkins, finally a true alpha coming in there to snatch up 25 to likely 30% of the target share. So Larry Fitzgerald for me is just a do not draft right now. He's going ahead of guys like, in my opinion, Randall Cobb. Look, I know people don't like Randall Cobb because
because Bill O'Brien acquired him. But Randall Cobb had over 800 yards last year, and he's only 29 years old. How are you going to be taking uh, Larry Fitzgerald over that type of a guy in Randall Cobb who's going to work out of the slot with Deshaun Watson and no real true alpha receiver in that offense? It's just absolutely mind-boggling. He's going ahead of guys like Hunter Renfro, who were like number two in yards per route run last year out of the entire slot. It's insane. He's going ahead of guys like Cole Beasley. He's going just ahead of so many rookies. It's not a spot that I really want to be getting to uh, when you're drafting at best a wide receiver three in this offense at a very old and aging age. I'm happy he got his $11 million check this year. That's pretty awesome, but not going to be somebody that I even touch personally. And then two more honorable mentions that I don't have as much of a, a strong grasp about, but I just wanted to point out in terms of my current rankings based on their ADP. Amari Cooper's currently going as a wide receiver seven. He's currently my wide receiver 13. So it's likely that I never actually get Amari Cooper. I don't think he's a terrible draft pick. I personally don't think CD Lamb crushes Amari Cooper or Michael Gallup. Again, Randall Cobb had 800 plus yards out of the slot last year. There's 120 or so targets to go around between Jason Witten and Randall Cobb being gone. I don't think CD Lamb's coming in and snatching up 100 plus targets and 1,000 plus yards in his rookie year. If he does, then it'll impact them. But if he only has 700 to 800 yards, it's literally going to be the Randall Cobb replacement. Amari Cooper at seven is not the worst thing in the world. So that's why he's not up higher on these things rankings, but I probably won't ever get to him since he's my wide receiver 13. And then Cooper Cup's currently my wide receiver 20, but he's going off the board at wide receiver 10. If you watch my must draft video, check it out. Robert Woods, I like much more than Cooper Cup because Robert Woods role is not in jeopardy like Cooper Cup's role is in this new and revamped 12 personnel Rams offense. So Cooper Cup to me is not a top 10 receiver. He is borderline top 15, but I have him right now at wide receiver 20. So he's somebody that I'm probably not going to be drafting. So thank you so much for tuning into the video. Please take a second of your time, hit the big old subscribe button that's about to pop up. Download those free rookie rankings. If you watched it this far, take the seconds down below, download the free rookie rankings. They're right down there. It takes two seconds of your time. Hitting the subscribe button really does help me. I appreciate it. And answer, answer, please do answer that question of the day that we had at the beginning of the show down below in the comment section. Who would you rather have? Calvin Ridley or Debo Samuel? Let me know in the comment section. Appreciate y'all. You can follow me. You can reach out in the comment section or you can follow me or reach out over on Twitter at DFS. Hope you have a great rest of your day, everybody. Stay safe out there and I will see you all in the next one.